So just to review a little bit, we talked about, obviously, like, the idea that, like, worship, that, that everybody worships, right? That, like, in the general sense, uh, lost people are constantly worshiping. They're just worshiping idols. And we are always worshiping. We just have to be reminded and constantly fixing our eyes on Christ and always worshiping our one true God and forsaking our idols. Um, and I really liked uh, what Dr. Westerholm spoke on idols yesterday and uh, just that, that very frightening phrase at the end of that passage, at the end of that psalm, of that uh, those who... I'm, I should look this up and read it properly, but basically, when you worship idols or when you make idols you become them. Uh, and how, you know, the idols have hands, but they do not feel. They have eyes, but they do not see. And so you become that. You become unable to feel how much you're ruining your life and unable to see how much you're hurting other people. Um, and so that was an awesome and uh, scary reminder, but uh, a good word. Um, we also talked about... Uh, Obviously, we kind of defined a little bit more of Christian worship, looked at a lot of different definitions of what makes Christian worship separate from idol worship. Um, and then we talked about music, right? Why we think about music when we think of worship. Um, let's hit that again, because that's, I think that's an important part. So why, just shout out, let's get some crowd participation here. <laughs> why, why do we think about music when we think of worship? Right, So there are positive and negative reasons why we associate worship with music, right? The positive reasons being music is a part of worship. The Bible commands us to sing. Um, you know, the heavenly hosts sing around the throne of heaven. Um, you know, when, when we, we will sing, holy is the lamb who is worthy to be slain, you know. Um, so there's positive reasons, biblical commands to sing. And then there's also the not positive... <laughs> sometimes negative reasons of the fact that, you know, worship is a genre. Uh, worship is a multi-million dollar industry. Um, and a lot of people can just kind of cash in on that over and over and over again. Um, even, uh, even Christian contemporary radio has changed so much since, since when I was a kid that it's, uh, it's mostly some form of what at least the artist would call worship music right? Like, there's not as many uh, more, like, storytelling or thematic songs. Uh, you know, the radio's kind of taken over by either someone's mega church that puts out a record or something like that. And again, I'm not opposed to churches putting out music and not opposed to the worship industry as a whole. Um, but it's just, it's become, we're kind of saturated with it right now, right? To the point to where, like, you know, I... I was, a I was a huge CCM nerd when I was a kid and just followed it so closely. And I still go to like some of those websites that I used to visit all the time when I was like 13 that like review Christian music and stuff. And uh, it's funny to see artists in interviews kind of complain about that, about the fact that like, you know, we can't, we can't get our like Christian rock song on the radio because the radio only wants to play worship music now. And even though we might hear that worship music and be like, I don't really think that's worship music, <laughs> you know? So there's, there's it's, it's kind of an, in, we live like in an interesting tension in what uh, the Christian music industry is doing. And um, just like any other form of media, for the general church population, and I know Buck Run is kind of an anomaly, um, but for the general evangelical world population, uh, Christian radio, Christian Spotify playlist, uh, those are, uh, dis those have more time in front of and discipling the average Christian than churches do. Uh, and so uh, they have a lot of power in shaping our theology of worship and shaping what we think is acceptable, what we think is normal. Um, and if we don't have resources like our worship conference, like this class and like, uh, you know, really trusted institutions, we can, we can kind of drift away from what a real theology of worship is and what makes it important, what sets it apart from just regular uh, worldly practices. Uh, and it's really important that we make those distinctions and we cling to them. So uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, 
the worship landscape. Let's see. This is, no, I'm skipping ahead. Here we go. Point by point. We've already done all this. Anytime you want to fix my PowerPoint, Micah. You're welcome. We created a genre. Okay. Okay. Um, we talked about why we must have music again. We're commanded to sing Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19. Um, the triune God sets the example. Uh, let's, let's pull up some of these scriptures real quick, because I don't think we covered these in the class last week. Uh, can someone find, uh, I'll go to Zephaniah, if someone could find Matthew 26.30 and Ephesians 5.18-19. Uh, Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one he will, who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. It's amazing to think that the Lord your God is, is singing over you, right? That's incredible. And why would, we, why would they use that kind of language if that wasn't what was actually happening? And just to picture that of, of the idea of song being used in the heavens um, and what that must sound like, what that must feel like, is incredible. Uh, someone have uh, Matthew 26, 30. Yeah, so Jesus there, Jesus singing a hymn with his disciples. Uh, Ephesians 5, 18 through 19. So there's the Spirit. There's the Spirit. You can't... Uh, you can't be indwelled by the Spirit and do something that the Spirit doesn't want you to do. So the Spirit is clearly like he's endorsing, he's enabling that worship through song. Uh, John 4, 24. God is spiritual. Yes. And we talked about that last week too, right? That the Spirit enables our worship. Uh, so the Trinity it even exemplifies the use of song in worship. Um, uh, music is an avenue for creativity. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Where are we at? Okay. Music stirs up God-glorifying emotion. We talked about that a little bit about um, the, the blessing and the pitfall of emotion in music, right? And we talked about this some yesterday at the worship conference, you may remember, particularly in the, in the panel discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll share a story again that I shared in the panel. Uh, one of the things that like led to an, an adolescent crisis of faith for me was I remember um, my first like really 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 moving, powerful moment, uh, emotional moment in a worship concert. Um, I grew up again in a church that was traditional in the sense of like twentieth century, early twentieth century traditional, right? Like piano, organ, hymns, that kind of generation. Um, and I went to this concert in St. Louis, and it was a band called, I think it was called like Among Thorns or something like that. It kind of fizzled out. Uh, but uh, it was an intimate show. It was small. It was a much smaller crowd than they expected, so we all got to be really close. And I just never heard this kind of approach to worship music before. You know, like the lights were intense and the music was loud and it was like you know ripping off U2 the entire time and like Coldplay just like totally stealing their riffs and putting Jesus lyrics on top of it and if you are a fan of Coldplay you know that like it's it's emotionally stirring music it's powerful and that's just the way God designed chord progressions right um and so I remember with it was me and my two best friends, and I remember literally being on my knees with my arms around my brothers and just like weeping and rejoicing and, and worshiping. And then time goes on, I learn more about worship, and I have like a crisis of faith where I look back and I think, was that worship? Was that real? Or was I just like, I, I, I don't remember anything about the gospel from that. I don't remember learning anything about who Jesus is. I know I probably like sang the word Jesus at some point, uh, but I couldn't tell you any of the lyrics. Um, the two guys who I had my arms around uh, have since completely abandoned the faith. 
uh, they were my closest brothers, I thought. And, uh, you know, there's divorce and broken families and all kinds of things in, in the wake of those decisions. And I had this crisis where I thought, like, man, the most moving moment for me emotionally was fake. It was just flat. There was no substance to it. And thankfully, we talked about this a little bit yesterday about when your crisis of faith happens is really important, right? Like, I tend to judge uh, 30-year-olds who are having this crisis of faith and who are deconstructing and the ex-evangelical movement. That stuff irritates me. But I have to remember that, like, I'm just lucky enough that I had that when I was 16. And I was still in my home uh, with a faithful, loving father who was a pastor and a theologian who was gracious with me. Uh, I saw Herschel walk by, like, you're supposed to be teaching, bro. (laughs) 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 Threw me off, sorry. But, like, a dad who walked with me through that in grace. And I have to remember that, like, I'm blessed in when that hit in my timeline and that some of these like 35-year-olds who are having this crisis of faith don't have that. They don't have that support system. They don't have a healthy church that can draw them back in. That's why discipleship and church community is so important. And that's why it's important for all of us to be equipped with this kind of stuff so that we can know that like, you know what? As silly as that concert was, and I've come to after wrestling with this for years, as silly as that moment was and as um, emotional as I was, I was saved when I was there. And in my heart, I was worshiping God. Now, I think the expressions of that worship were less than ideal. I think what got me to that place was mostly emotional manipulation through some crafty tools. I don't think anyone in that band had the intent of emotionally manipulating anyone. I think there were good intentions from everyone in that room. It was not malicious. It was just uh, undeveloped theology of worship at work and, and what happens in that. And so, you know, my dad was gracious in walking me through that. It'd be like, hey, these guys aren't villains, and you're you're not Charles Spurgeon with all the answers either. You know what I mean? Like, you just need to calm down. <laughs> They're just faithful men doing their best who make mistakes, and you are just, you know, blown away by a minor six chord for the first time. Like, it's, it's going to happen. Um, so, all I have to say, music does stir up emotion, and we need to just walk that line of, of is it God-glorifying emotion? Uh, Sovereign Grace does this really well. I kind of put McKinsey on the spot in the panel yesterday and asked her about that. Um, But like, you know, Sovereign Grace is kind of known for walking that line, that balance of head and heart, right? It's doctrinally sound worship music, um, but they're very emotional in their expressions. Some would even call them charismatic. Um, I was a member of a charismatic church. I would disagree. (laughs) Like, y'all don't know charismatic yet if you think Sovereign Grace is charismatic. But... um, but they are very emotive, you know, like you can spot Bob Coughlin in any conference because you just look for this, yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's, that's his posture, like he's just loving it, he's uh, easily edified like they talked about yesterday, um, so, and that's a positive thing, so it's good that music stirs up God-glorifying emotion um, as long as we know that we should not use that to manipulate people into wrong doctrine or... Uh, anything else. Also, music is an avenue of creativity that honors uh, the creator. It is so good for us to use creativity um, because we act as sub-creators glorifying the creator, right? So God is a creator God. I think we don't, we don't dwell on that enough, I think we need to remember uh, that one of the coolest things, one of the most glorious things about God is he's a creator. He is the ultimate creator. Um, I can't paint or draw to save my life. I'm awful at it. I wanted to get into it. Um, Angeline has some awful paintings that I tried for her a couple times. They're just really bad. Uh, But, 
you know, the heavens declare. And when we start to think about that, like, I love uh, one of the things that kind of connects intergenerationally in our church. I love when I see on Facebook, whether it's a, a sixth grader or a 80-year-old who takes a picture of the sunsets behind and just says, they all go straight to the heavens declare. We just know it. We see that sunset and we know like that is God at work. He created the atmospheres to, to reflect light in this certain way. And even though most of it's probably pollution, like it's okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, exactly. He's, he, he made all things so we can just enjoy it anyways. Um, but God is a creator God. And when we, when we create for his glory and in his name, whether that's through songwriting or whether that is through painting. You know, my, my uncle is a, is a wildlife painter, and he paints to the glory of God. He wants to paint the wildlife that God created and draw people into his majesty. Um, so creating as, uh, as Mike Cosper calls it, sub-creators to the glory of God, to the glory of the creator, is, is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Um, Dr. York uh, said this yesterday, music, particularly with theologically rich lyrics, is a wonderful expression of worship because it engages the whole person, the gathered body, and the memory of biblical truths. Some of this will break down more in the following weeks, um, but it is important that it, it does engage the whole body. You know, God made all of our senses. Um, we can feel uh, the rhythm of the music. We can move our hands and bodies to the rhythm of the music. We can hear uh, the sounds. We can sing with our voices. Uh, just so much of our body is engaged um, in, in the act of singing. And then also, and we'll talk about this more later, but the, the way that the congregation sings together and the importance of hearing each other sing and what that does for your spirit. I can't tell you how amazing it was to hear y'all sing at the worship conference yesterday when we started. I could have stood up there and listened to that for the rest of the day because being in that small, echoey room with just your voices everywhere was tremendous. And that's, that's what we want on a Sunday morning. I want, always want you guys to be drowning me out. Uh, make that your goal. Be like, all right, today I'm going to sing louder than a PA system. Let's do it. Um, so why we must have more than music. Um, music is not the only way to worship. Um, music is just one expression of worship. And uh, music is not the primary element of the service. Um, what we do in this praise band is super important. I've got like the whole praise band here this morning. But they will tell you like this is part of our doctrine. This is part of our understanding. Um, Acts Acts 6, verses 2 through 4 says, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Take out um, serving tables and replace it with playing guitar or leading worship. Um, we can't step away from what is most important. Uh, you know, Herschel always talks about how the architecture of this building is designed to reflect our priorities, where the dead center of this entire building is the pulpit. And that's uh, symbolically significant because we want the preaching of the word of God to be the center of what we do here. It is the it is the center point of our worship service. It is the most important part of our worship service. Um, there are no, there's no collection of songs, no liturgy we could sing that could ever replace the preaching of God's word. It just can't be done. It's just not there. Uh, God moves and speaks through the preaching of his word. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.2. I'm on my phone because I thought theoretically that'd be faster than me flipping there, but maybe it's not. Uh, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. 
they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Do you think we've hit that time yet? <laughs> that uh, will not endure sound teaching? My goodness, just, <laughs> yeah, just the stuff that we see day in and day out that we're uh, being commanded to accept and to call normal and to ratify uh, and to the point to where it's just totally beyond logic and reason. It's beyond sound teaching. Um, so it's so important that we center ourselves around God's word and around that sound teaching and that be what galvanizes us before we go back out into the world. Yeah. I think it's, I would say it is a problem, but I would I don't think most people would view it as such. And it's one of those things where, like, you know, we don't order our service that way for a reason, right? Like, and we'll talk about that more about how, like, our liturgy is structured the way it is intentionally. Um, but it's super common. And there's a lot of reasons. I think depending on, you know, church by church basis, there's a lot of reasons of why that could be. And if you haven't been to a church like that, I just trust me they're common where you'll go in and it'll be like a big opening song and then you know kind of like we do an opening song and then like a pastor will do a welcome and then there's like a song service and they'll use that term where it's like four five six seven songs it's a long time 35 40 minutes of singing and then like a 25 minute sermon and then like two more songs um I don't think there's like enough clear scripture to say like that's a sin. <laughs> I just think it's unwise. Uh, I think I think you need to make your first things be your first things, and I think the preaching of the word needs to be important. Um, I love singing, and I I could sing with you guys all day long, um, but you have to set apart the gathered time of worship on a Sunday morning. It is a sacred thing that I think needs more careful planning and more careful structure than just um, a good time of singing together. I think there's a, a time and a place for that kind of act. You know, we do like the, the hymn singing out here, where all we do is sing. And I think that's awesome. Um, I love concerts where all you do is you go together and you just worship through song. I think that's great. Um, but yeah, I think we, we have a pretty high standard for like the gathered body on Sunday morning. Like that's, that's pretty key. And so I think there's elements of like, there's still a lot of churches who think if we cut songs, we lose people. Um, there's a lot of, uh, and we talked about this last week, a lot of this idea, whether it's, whether it's spoken or just subconscious, of the worship music is what fills seats. And so we're going to fill as many seats as we can with whatever we got to do in the worship, and then we'll like sneak attack, 25 minute sermon, like hit them with the gospel. And like, like you said, like it's sound teaching, it's good stuff. Uh, but then we'll give them some more, we'll cushion on the other end with some more songs. Um, that approach kind of came out of the worship wars and we'll talk about the worship wars today. Um, and again, I don't, that's not the way that we would do it and it's not the way that I think we're commanded to do it. But again, I have a ton of grace for folks who are in those churches and who are in those positions because a lot of times they're just not thinking about it the same way that we are. And I think if they, if you just sat down with them and kind of showed them some things, I, I, like I don't think it's like a fighting situation. I think most of the time they'd be like, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. I just hadn't thought about that before. Because it's amazing how little people spend developing a theology of worship. Um, you know, Buck Run is unique in its adult discipleship program, period. That doesn't happen in most places. Most places it's like, you know, Lifeway Sunday School curriculum or whatever, you know. Um, so to have a church that prioritizes, like, here's some key doctrines. We're going to spend time on Sunday morning, like, working on these things is rare. It's even more rare to think through theology of worship stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think... I think in churches like that, it is like a, just some flip-flop priorities and some misunderstanding of the purpose of music and worship. That's a good question. Um, the true worship leader is the preaching pastor. 
I don't like how quickly Herschel was able to point this out yesterday, <laughs> but it is true. Um, you know, I, my title is worship pastor, and that is a misnomer, right? Like it's, but again, like we're just operating within a culture that has certain understandings and certain applications of, so when people hear the term worship pastor, they know what I do. They know that I am not the preacher. They know that I lead the music, even though we know worship is more than music. But again, we just operate in this world. We use the world's language uh, and, and up until a point <laughs> uh, with careful guards. And so there's nothing wrong with calling me the worship pastor and Herschel the preaching senior pastor and Chris. You know, those are just terms that help us kind of categorize and know what people are. But the true worship leader is uh, the, the pastor. Um, someone want to read Acts 20, verse 28? So overseers of, of what? Yeah, overseers of the church. And what does the church do? It worships, <laughs> right? Uh, so the, the, the chief overseer of the church who worships, that is the de facto worship leader. Um, and that is a rightly ordered understanding of, of how the church should function. <laughs> right? Yeah, we did a worship conference with two songs at the beginning, and that was it. <laughs> Yeah, music, the term music minister kind of came out of fashion at some point, and I think because of a shift in theology of worship in a lot of churches where uh, the music minister in churches, when that term was like the, the key term and used a lot, like I'm thinking like early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, music minister was very much like a, uh, kind of like a production manager, you know what I mean? Like it was a it was a big deal, and it was cantatas, and it was like a whole lot of things other than pastoring. And so I think that's why, as the theology of worship kind of shifted uh, with, the, with some other things in evangelical culture, thanks to some, you know, some great folks like Bob Coughlin and the Gettys, and um, I'm blanking, but a bunch of folks who, like in the early 2000s, started to change the way that we think about worship in a popular way, popularized a good theology of worship. I think that, that term kind of fizzled out because they're like, no, there is like a shepherding aspect, an overseeing aspect to, to the music ministry. It's more than just music. So, yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about the worship landscape. Um, it's important for us to know the world in which we operate, to know... Um, context that other people are functioning in, other Southern Baptist churches are functioning in, other uh, confessional churches, um, and to just kind of look at recent history to see maybe how we got where we are. Um, but the modern evangelical church of the West is a multifaceted worshiper. Uh, it is diverse in style, approach, instrumentation, culture, history, socioeconomics, ethnicity, liturgy, priorities, uh, etc. And uh, even among the SBC, there is no one way of doing worship. Um, Westerholm had a great quote yesterday. He was like, if you've seen one SBC church, you've seen one SBC church. <laughs> right? We're, uh, one of the cool things that comes with its own bag of challenges of like our autonomous nature is we are all very different. Um, and just, you know, I use this as an example, but uh, Angeline and I, we fit in great at Buck Run. We, we love, I think we do. Do we fit in okay? Um, we, love, we love a lot of this, everything about Buck Run, but we come from very, very different church backgrounds, even though we are both lifelong Southern Baptists. We were born and raised in a Southern Baptist church. I was born and raised in a Southern Baptist church that had about 200 people, and it was surrounded by corn in southern Illinois, and every stereotype you think about a country church was us. That was it, and I loved it. Um, Angeline grew up in an urban setting in uh, one of the most dangerous counties in Maryland. <laughs> uh, we were, Faith Baptist was on the same block as the most dangerous subdivision in Maryland, yeah, or 
Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, but also, partly because the socioeconomic range in that neighborhood was very, very wide to where you had houses near the church that were very wealthy and like streets over was like extreme poverty. And it's just the nature of, you know, suburbs and urban sprawl over time. And uh, plus it's near DC. So there's a ton of immigrants, right? The immigration population is huge. Um, And by the time we left uh, Faith Baptist to come to Louisville to study at Boyce, uh, it was like 70% first-generation African-American immigrants, African immigrants, yeah, Um, which we talked about as a whole, you know, majority black church, but a whole different worship style than what you think of the black church, because they're, they haven't been in the States for years, they're like first generation. So she grew up in a church that literally never sang hymns, like the worship wars were not even a thing, they just were like, we're going to do like praise and worship songs, like the praise and worship genre of the 80s and 90s. That's our thing. And that's what we're going to do. And so, you know, like, uh, gosh, give me an example of some of, the, some of the staples. Like Waves of Mercy. You guys remember that song? Like the, with the motions? <laughs> waves of Mercy, Waves of Grace? Like, yeah. So, stuff like, so that's what she grew up in. So we're coming from, we're both coming in from Southern Baptist churches I only sang hymns. She didn't know what hymns were. You know, like, we're learning. (laughs) She was totally ignorant. No. Um, But, like, even some of the hymns that I love, like, we have learned together uh, in our marriage. Because, you know, like, uh, Be Thou My Vision. We love that song. We didn't sing that song in my country church. Right. Yeah, exactly. So all that to say, uh, Southern Baptist churches are extremely diverse, and not just diverse in ethnicity and, and socioeconomic status, but just diverse in their expressions of worship. And I think that's a good thing, uh, as long as we keep that in the back of our mind whenever we're kind of interacting with other folks. Um, the current landscape... So if we're just kind of standing on a mountaintop and surveying the landscape of uh, worship theology among evangelicals and among the SBC in particular, the current landscape reflects the scars of a period called the worship wars. Who has heard of the term worship wars before? Okay. Um, someone want to throw out, like, what's your, what's your idea of worship wars? What do you think that that refers to? The struggle Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly where we're heading. So we talked about that. Uh, term worship war is a misnomer because there is no right or wrong. There's no winners or losers. There's just the trail of the dead. <laughs> uh, it was a pattern of self-harm, led to church splits, churches born out of preferences, churches divided across genre-specific churches or services. So let me just be completely frank with you. I, my first full-time job in a church was leading the contemporary service of a, of a county seat Baptist church that had been there forever. And theologically, I am opposed to genre-specific services. Um, and my goal, had we stayed there, our goal was to eventually lead the church through a migration of those and, and bring them together, which thankfully I can say the church, that church has done now. Um, but this was super, super common for a long time, to have a traditional service and a contemporary service. And those two words uh, are kind of the, the two bunkers of the worship wars. So what do we think of when we think of a traditional service? Hymns. The songs Jesus sang from 1825, yeah, exactly. Huh? Piano and organ, yeah, so we think about our instrumentation. So let's put those over here then, we'll say praise songs. 
which what a funny name for a genre, right? Like these aren't, you know, or same thing. These aren't hymns, you know, but yeah, let's say drums, guitars. Yep. I remember a deacon stopping me going into church. Uh, there was a, I'm telling you, y'all, I got, I got trauma from the worship wars, okay? <laughs> going into a business meeting where we were going to vote on whether or not my Christian rock band could have a concert at our church with other Christian rock bands from the area. And a, a deacon saying to my mom, like, don't you forget, Stephanie, there's no drums in heaven. And my mom said, my mom, right, my mom said, what about, what about like the, the symbols that it talks about? And he's like, well, fine, there's symbols, but there's no drums. <laughs> like, what, what a solid argument. <laughs> All right, so we think about hymns, we think about piano and organ, we think about praise songs and drums, guitars. Right. I, unless, unless it's a black church. Yeah. So what would lead, what would lead traditional churches as we think of in the worship wars to be so anti-emotion? Because it couldn't have been that way forever, right? Yes. So what was happening is 1850s, right, like, this is when the charismatic movement kind of starts. No one knows about it yet, but like we have the documentation. That's when it starts. It's growing. So by the time you get to late 80s, early 90s, when the worship wars are at their peak, no, was, she was saying like the 80s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, we have churches who are, have dug in their trenches to guard themselves from an actual real threat, but don't know what the real warning signs of that threat are, right? So they're seeing things like being slain in the spirit, um, speaking in tongues, uh, healing movements. You know, they used to, like these con artists used to do like the, the, the f- staged... Yeah, yeah, exactly. You've got Benny Hinn on TV at this point, and so you're seeing him like use the force to like knock down 50 people, <laughs> and you're like, not in my church, right? Like, so you put up walls right away, and you put up walls like Benny Hinn's got a drum set and a band and all that junk. Like, we're singing hymns. We're sticking to the, you know, give me that old-time religion, right? Because we're going to put up these walls to protect ourselves from an actual danger, a real misuse of God's word and a real perversion of theology. But because we're human and because we are not, in, you know, we do not have a divine revelation from God outside of God's word, like we make mistakes when we put up walls and we block out things that don't need to be blocked out. And so we block out stuff like instrumentation. We block out emotion. Uh, yeah, there is a, a, a brother of mine who I love um, who recently went to a church. Um, it's a big church, popular church. And uh, I was just talking about how excited I was for him. And he said, I'm, I'm going to miss the way that we've done baptisms. I'm going to miss hearing people applaud after someone comes out of the water. I was like, why? Because we're not allowed to clap when people are baptized. We're not allowed to clap during the music. This is a big church that's still existing today where some of these fears are still there. Like, if there's a time to rejoice in the church, it's in that public testimony of we were buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. I can't tell you how hard it is as your worship pastor to hold it together when that happens and not just like weep 
Because that's a momentous occasion. It should be a momentous occasion in, the per- in that person's life. And it's a public testimony, right? It's we are telling our church that this is the decision I've made. And what an amazing way for us to encourage that person than to hear you know, this uproarious applause and I hear cheers and woo-hoos from people who've never met this kid or this, this young woman. And, and we're saying like, yeah, like we are here to support you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to rally around you. We're going to help you walk through life together. That's so important. And so being afraid that like, if we're so scared of the charismatic movement that we can't clap when someone comes out of the water, we need to pause <laughs> and reassess. You know, yeah, Keith. Right. And so it's, it comes back to, to where, where is God in your heart? Yes. And how are you, not so much position of your body, but position of your heart. Because, you know, just like the concert I went to, this can be totally fake, right? Or not even necessarily faked, but like manipulated and, and kind of conjured out of, out of a, a shallow sea, <laughs> you know? The warning is, look at your own relationship mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. There is nothing wrong with silently and prayerfully absorbing uh, the rich text of him being sung over you. And a lot of that, too, comes into culture as well. You know, like my northern Midwestern family, like they're never going to be in the Bob Coughlin pose, but they're still worshiping. You know what I mean? They just receive it differently. And part of that's you just Midwesterners don't do that. <laughs> no self-respecting Midwesterner does this in worship. What what a blessed culture shock, like Faith Baptist was for me, growing up in my town of three thousand people that was a hundred percent white by design. Let me just say that, like they made it that way on purpose. And I can tell you horror stories of the stuff I grew up with enduring. Uh, from my peers and my bosses at my first jobs as a kid, uh, when I worked at Dairy Queen and a black family came through the drive through horrible stuff. It was all white by design. To then go to, like, suburban Maryland and be surrounded by... No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me be clear. My dad fought against that tooth and nail. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, to then go and and see all these different cultures together in one church, and the ways that they would ex, you know express worship to the Lord, um, the fact that a lot of the African immigrants uh, only knew hymns and not praise songs, because they are descendants of people who were saved by early missionaries to Africa. How cool is that? You know what I mean? That you've got these missionaries in the fifties going to Kenya, and they're like, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what else to sing, uh, here's just as I am, you know, and so now in, in 2008, you have this first generation Kenyan immigrant who's like, why don't we ever sing just as I am, like, that's like my heart song, you know what I mean, <laughs> and so the way that, like, music shapes people, the way that cultures express stuff, uh, we had um, Miss Etta, I was leading worship one time, Miss Etta was African-American, she'd been you know, born in, in the States. So again, different cultural expression than African immigrants. And uh, we sang the song um, by Delirious. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Open up the doors and let the music play. So again, like, think of where I'm coming from, and I'm leading that song in worship. It's just me on guitar. There's no band but I'm, I'm feeling it. I'm enjoying it. You know, I had my one year at a charismatic church, so I can, I can emote. <laughs> and Miss Etta goes into the music room right around the corner, grabs a tambourine, and it's just like, bam, 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 like all the way down, all the way down the center aisle. And then, she, you know, the lyrics say, open up the doors. And this was a church, older church, that had two front, the two big red doors were at the front of the church and looked out onto the street. She's like, we're opening up these doors. And this community is going to hear us play and sing to the Lord. And she literally cracked those doors open, like, swing wide, you heavenly gates. Like, we're going we're gonna to let the town hear the music. 
that would have been, like, there would have been people in my home church who were like, this woman is insane. Like, we need to get her some help. What is going on? And, and so, my, to Angeline's point is that there are so many different factors of where we grew up, where uh, we were discipled, uh, the kind of popular culture we were surrounded in that impacts how we worship. And I think um, Dr. York hit the nail on the head yesterday because we're, <laughs> this is the point you're going to get to. Yeah, we're going to talk about this later in, in why we shape our worship here at Buck Run the way we do. But just to throw out a spoiler of like the, one of the best ways I've heard this communicated, there, are, there can be unlimited cultural expressions of worship there cannot be cultural mandates of worship. You just need, that's so much truth, you can just take a shower in it. Like, that's, that's so good. Because we need to understand that, like, you know, Miss Edda's tambourine and throwing open the doors, like, that's a cultural expression, and it didn't violate any command of God, and it was beautiful, and it encouraged us. But it's not a mandate. I can't tell any of you to grab a tambourine and run down the aisle and throw open the doors, Right? Um, our cultural expressions of lifting our hands. Bob will be the first to tell you, this is a cultural expression, it's not a mandate. He never wants you to feel like, if I don't raise my hands, I'm not worshiping the Lord. Um, you know, I, I am, I, I've, I've gotten better, but I am a crier. <laughs> it's like, you know, I feel like I'm getting a tighter grip on my emotions. But I used to just cry a lot. And I, that's a cultural expression. It's not a mandate. Like, I don't want you to ever feel like, if I'm not crying in worship, I'm doing something wrong. Because Scripture alone is our mandates for worship. That's the only place where we find what must be done in worship. Anything else outside of that, you have to filter through the lens of Scripture and take with scriptural wisdom uh, before you can decide if it's appropriate or not. Micah. My, my dad went to, uh, went to Russia three times in the early 90s, right after the Soviet Union fell, because it was the first time that they were letting folks come in, and he still had to be secretive about what he was doing there. Um, but he had a camcorder with him, and he recorded, he set it up to record the service, and you've got this beautiful old ex-Russian Orthodox church that had been abandoned and was now being... Uh, filled by Southern Baptists, Russian Southern Baptists. And um, their cultural expression was greet each other with a holy kiss. My dad's like a masculine country boy. And he just had to be like, all right, I know that every elder and every deacon in this church is going to come up here, they're excited I'm here, and they're going to kiss me. It's not the European kiss on the cheek, right? But, no, we have video, VHS, of all of these big, burly Russian men coming over, embracing my dad, and kissing him square on the lips. And that is not a cultural mandate, all right? <laughs> he did not come back to First Baptist Red, but be like, men, we're going to start kissing. But in Russia, he knows, I am not going to break these, this man's heart and deny him his expression of love and uh, appreciation. <laughs> I'm getting choked up because, oh my goodness. My dad's heart is broken right now watching all this unfold. Uh, because I think there was a period there where things were looking up and, uh, this, this uh, smacks so much of the things that those, that poor church had been through. So I was not expecting to get caught off guard by that uh, random emotion from a Russian church, but here we are. I told you I was a crier, see? I said I was getting it together, and I'm not. Oh, my goodness. Um, but he knew, as awkward as it was for him to receive that kiss, he was not going to throw off their way of demonstrating their appreciation. Uh, he was not going to undermine their cultural expression. And I think that's so important for us to remember when we interact with folks who have 
different cultural expressions of worship than we do, is that, uh, you know, we have the mandates from Scripture. Everything else doesn't mean everything else goes. Don't hear me say that. Uh, but it does mean we have grace and we filter it through the lens of Scripture. So one thing I'll say, just, you know, kind of a teaser trailer of what's to come, just so you don't, I don't want this to end today with you thinking that I approve of every cultural expression of worship. Uh, don't, please don't go to Dr. York and be like, do you know? <laughs> uh, it's definitely not an everything goes situation, um, but it is one that we handle with grace. But when we are building the liturgy, and, and we'll talk more about, too, about what liturgy means, but when we're building the liturgy of um, Buck Run, culture is a factor, right? We consider the culture of Buck Run. Uh, a lot of people think that, like, every Sunday morning, we're singing Adrian's favorite songs. Y'all need to know, we sing songs that I don't always love. I don't, I don't like, hate them. I don't, like, dislike them. But we're not singing my favorite worship songs every Sunday. Because I'm just one, right, yeah, just the ones that sound like Coldplay, inside band joke. Uh, but I'm just one member here. I am, a, I am a pastor here, and I'm an overseer, and I'm going to guide you guys to good music. But the culture of Buck Run that has been here long before me is a factor in how we plan worship. Because that is important. Your history, your tradition here is important. And even if it looks different than what, if I could just start a new church tomorrow with the same people and, and set out whatever order of worship I wanted to, it's not going to look like that here every Sunday because we want to honor and respect where you guys have come from. And not just the folks who have been at Buck Run Forever, but the folks who are joining us from other contexts. And so uh, one of the big misnomers about traditional and contemporary is that we pigeonhole it into those things, it's so much more than that. Because what Angeline's church did was contemporary. If I did Angeline's set here, yeah, if I did the set from their worship pastor here, it, would, it wouldn't be called traditional, but it wouldn't be called contemporary, right? Because it's already 20, 30 years old. Uh, the hymns that we think are traditional aren't traditional. <laughs> Most of the hymns that we think of when we think of a traditional service came out of the 20th century. The 20th. We're not even talking 1800s, 1700s, 1500s. I can tell whenever I go to sing hymns at a nursing home, I can tell which of the residents grew up Baptist and which grew up anything else. Because the Baptists, man, they light up on just as I am or I'll fly away. Like, they are feeling it, and God bless them. But when I sing, Be Thou My Vision, or Come Thou Fount, I'm like, I haven't heard this one. What, what is he singing? But the sweet old Methodist lady lights up. That's a song I know. That's important. It's important that we consider that when we are building worship, because worship is, it's our communal experience that we're going to walk through together and cater in very carefully so that uh, our cultures are honored, but they are not directive, they're not mandates, and we take what biblical good there was from our faulty attempts, our frail attempts from our past, we bring those together, and we worship God in unity. And uh, we'll talk about this more, but worship, one of the glories of worshiping together is preference and deference. You know, sometimes you get your preferences, sometimes you defer to the preferences of others, but what unites us is that the key of all of that worship is the glory of God, it's the magnifying of his name, it's the proclaiming of Jesus Christ as Lord, it's the confession of our sins, uh, the repentance of our sins, it's knowing that the blood of Jesus is sufficient for those sins, that there is grace for us, it's celebrating that together. And so whatever expressions we bring in, whether it's the 60 different varieties of contemporary or the 600 different varieties of traditional, we bring them together for one purpose, and the Spirit works in that, right? Because we already talked about worship, real worship, 
Christian worship is spirit-empowered. And when the spirit is working in our worship, whatever the biblical expression is that we're using, God will unite us in that. God will glorify uh, himself in that, and he'll build his church stronger. We're so much stronger when we can defer our preferences and worship with each other.